Good morning. Welcome to Casual Conversations. This is Scott Wade. I'm your host today. And every week, or most weeks anyway, on Casual Conversations, I'm glad that you're uh, making this a part of your day today. And somebody else that I'm glad is making it a part of their day is Reverend Steve Eng. Steve is back on with us. He's been a guest with us before. Good morning, Steve. Good morning. Good to be with you, Scott. It's great to have you. Thank you for joining me. Uh, you were on before as a representative of the National Association of Evangelicals. And why don't you just uh, take a minute before we get started on this Living In series, if you would uh, tell us a little bit about the NAE. Yeah, the NAE stands for the National Association of Evangelicals, and we've been around for eight years uh, representing and connecting evangelical leaders and other Christians and uh, providing resources for them and also encouraging them to use the influence that God has given them to bless our nation. So, um, yeah, we're the nation's largest, most diverse network of evangelical organizations, including 40 different denominations, hundreds of Christian colleges, universities, nonprofits, um, uh, networks, parachurch ministries. And so uh, it's a delight. And I serve as advocacy director. And so then I get to uh, talk to pastors and church leaders about the public policy work, which is one of the dimensions of what we do, and uh, to encourage them to use their influence to bless our nation. Well, I know you were with us uh, here in South Carolina a month or so ago, and uh, when you were here, you shared some materials with me and a group of men that we had gathered together and a church service that we attended, and you had other meetings uh, as well. But anyway, you shared some materials with me, and I want you to know that uh, people are interested in what the NAE does and in, in advocating for, for those who are uh, uh, in, in tough places and yeah. uh, they are... They, they just need help. And so yep. we want to we want to help the, the people that, that that need that help. And so thank you for doing that and for the work Absolutely. of the NAE. And uh, people, as I said, people are interested in your uh, information that you gave me, and the booklet that you gave me, the pamp or the brochures, those things, they, they move quicker off my book table than what my books do when I go out to speak. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Well, um, we are, uh, we're not here to talk about the NAE. We've done that before, right? But it, it's not a bad thing yeah. to talk about. As a matter of fact, I'm, I'm real pleased that we can. But I am had an idea. I don't know how long ago it was. I thought, you know, I, I'd like to talk to some, some of my friends about places where they live. And I started with a, a place or a couple of places in mind. I thought, I don't know if I'd really want to live there. And when you were here in South Carolina, I was joking around with you saying, I'm going to do a series on where I wouldn't want to live. And can I include Minnesota? <laughs> and uh, you said, oh, no, I, I think you I think you'd want to live here. It's a great place. You remember that conversation? I do remember that. Yeah. Yeah. You said something about unusual places. We don't think it's unusual at all to live in Minnesota. It's well, very normal. <laughs> it's very normal. Well, except for this year, the snow was not as deep and not as frequent. And we hardly had any snow. It's been we've had drought off and on, you know, over the last couple of years, um, and it's exceptionally warm. So we had days in January and February that oftentimes are below zero, and we had some temperatures in the 40s and 50s pretty regularly. Wow. So, um, so I, if I'd have visited this year, I might have been convinced that. Minnesota would be the place for me, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think last time you were on the, on the podcast, I mentioned the fact that I have um, I've read some books, both fiction and nonfiction, about uh, Minnesota, and I just am fascinated with a place called the Boundary Waters. Why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about the Boundary Waters? What is that? The Boundary Waters is a region in northeastern Minnesota. We call it the Arrowhead region because if you look on the map. It's sort of shaped like an arrowhead in the far northeastern corner, and it straddles the Canadian border, but there's many hundreds of lakes. They're crystal clear. Uh, it's pine forest. Uh, it's a wonderful place for fishing and, and hunting as well. There's bear and, and wolves, and um, but they don't allow in, in the boundaries of the boundary waters, um, uh, which refers, I think, to the U.S.-Canadian border because it's near the border. Uh, but that also within that that zone, 
there are no motorboats allowed at all. Mm. So it was very quiet. People canoe from lake to lake, they portage between lakes, uh, go camping, and it's just people from many parts of the U.S. come to have a wilderness experience. Also, it's a place that is, um, they have these maps of the darkest places that aren't impacted by sea lights, and it's one of the darkest places at night, too, and so it's a wonderful place for looking at the stars and, and just just reveling in God's handy. Man, that sounds fun. Maybe I do want to come to Minnesota. Yeah. I, I have uh, I have a, a bucket list thing that I want to do is to drive around all the uh, all the Great Lakes and I guess Lake Superior is one of those uh, ten thousand lakes in your state so uh, I better find my way to Minnesota hadn't I? Yeah, that's right exactly. Yep. So um, what what would you say would be the uh, your favorite thing about living in Minnesota? You know, asking about what's my favorite thing about Minnesota, it's hard to choose. And certainly family is huge for us because I was born and raised there. And my wife has relatives in the area as well. But just the seasons are so special. And sometimes it's winter. and I mean, it is winter when it's winter. And if it's a day in the 20s and it's sunny and there's snow on the ground and snow in the trees and I'm cross-country skiing in the woods, there's just something magical and stunningly beautiful about that. Um, and spring is you know you're anticipating summer and summer there's so many lakes and so people boat and fish and swim and many of the lakes are clean and sand bottom and so a lot of people kind of live at the lake you know it could be any one of those ten thousand lakes there's lots of homes and cabins around those lakes um and then fall there's a lot of beautiful fall colors and crisp leaves and all of that you know so each season is distinctly beautiful and we we love that about minnesota well, I grew up in the, I guess, the Great Lakes region in northwestern Ohio, and the the soil there was not sandy like it is in Michigan, because I've spent a lot of time in Michigan, and I, it's one of the things that was just fascinating to me, and you mentioned the Sandy Bottom Lakes there, is how much sand there is in those sand dunes in the, the western coast of Michigan. I don't know if you have that phenomenon on the western coast of um, Lake Superior or not, but what, why are there, why is there so much sand in that area of the country? You know, it just really depends on the part of the state you live in. I live in a kind of a rocky uh, part of the state in southeastern Minnesota that wasn't touched by glaciers. And so there's, you know, the kind of limestone underneath. Uh, I think it was the glaciers that sort of ground up the dirt and stuff and spread it across the, across the countryside. Um, and there's places that have very rich on Western Minnesota, deep black soil. And there's other places that have, you know, so there's a lot of different soil types, but it seems like where a lot of the lakes are were carved out by glaciers. And so I think the sand and the glaciers had something to do with each other. Okay. So that the sandy areas are where the, the lakes are by and large. Yeah. Okay. By and large. Yeah. Uh -huh. So what's been the most challenging thing about living in Minnesota? Well, they say we have two seasons, and that's um, winter and road construction. And so <laughs> sometimes, you know, the challenge is, is just navigating the roads, um, though we have good highways. Um, but that's a good that's a good question. I think when I was growing up, I had a January when I was in college. I remember this very distinctly, that there were 30 days in a row where the daytime high did not exceed zero degrees. And, uh, and so when I was, I lived on a campus on a hill and that wind came whipping over the hill and you had to, we literally ran to class. You're like, oh, really? One day I, I came home, I'd been gone, uh, went home that weekend, came back to my dorm room, dorm room, which is just single pane glass at that, at that point. And I opened my curtains and there was a wall of ice. So, uh, so there were, there were times, not so much now when I was back in the old days, I guess you could say, where, uh, Winters got pretty long, and and when we lived in Western Minnesota, uh, it was a little colder than where we live now in the state. And you know, if you get, you know, there was a couple of years where the ice didn't go off the lakes until like the first week of May, you know, where you get snow, you know, late April, and you go, really, you know, I think this has been long enough, you know. So uh, there are sometimes years like that that makes yeah. it pretty tough. Yeah. Well, see, now you're confirming that you you don't want to come here. So. Yeah. Now now we're going the wrong direction. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. They're just just come before November. When when does the first snow fly? You know, I would say 
anywhere between May to September, you're guaranteed the just really nice weather. Okay, May to September. I'll try to I'll try to keep yeah keep that in mind in my travel plans as I yeah. fulfill my bucket list <laughs> getting around the Great Lakes. Um, well, tell me um, what a life lesson or spiritual truth uh, have you learned from living in Minnesota? Well, you know, I think one thing is just simply just uh, admiring God's handiwork. There's just so many different uh, geographic. Um, uh, in different ecosystems, you know, and so just the variety of God's handiwork. So, so on a, on a natural basis, I think of that as far as people go. Um, I just really come to appreciate lots of different types of people in, in our state, whether that's people, um, and this is a growing edge for me, you know, uh, Native Americans who were here before we were um, in the late 1800s, a lot of Scandinavians and Germans. I came in and a lot of them had a deep faith or God was at work in their life, uh, whether that was, you know, Protestant or Catholic. Um, and so just some really solid salt of the earth people. Many of them were farmers who had to endure a lot of hardships. And so living on the prairie, some lived in sod houses, you know, or just, yeah, toughing those brutal winter, winters back then. Um, and then certainly today, you know, we're, uh, place that welcomes people from all around the world. And we've been particularly welcoming, I think, um, uh, compared to maybe some other places. Um, and uh, and so just to see the diversity of how God works through and gives us the opportunities to interact with people from all around the world is also a great, a great learning and growing experience for many of us here in Minnesota. Well, you know, uh, where I grew up in, in the Midwest wasn't it wasn't the best place for welcoming outsiders. And my experience in the Southeast has been, in many cases, has been been the same. What makes Minnesota um, more open that way? It's a really good question. I, I think some of it is a Northern European heritage that says we're kind of all in this together. And people who at least historically have endured hardship maybe understand and appreciate others who've endured hardship in their life, which has led them to come here. Um, so that, that might be part of it. Um, you know, we're, we're as diverse as a lot of parts of the country. There's people who are more red or more blue, uh, depending on where you come from. But um, I think there is some appreciation just for getting to know people who are different from us and, um, and understanding that people can be a blessing. Um, but there's there are also challenges with that too. I mean, not everybody's welcoming, and and we can all be feel threatened at times. Um, but for the most part, I think Minnesota has sort of known for that sense of welcome, and maybe for some of the reasons out. All right. Anything um, before we finish up? Is there anything else that you would want to uh, to share with our listeners? You know, I since the theme of this is sort of like what do I love about my state? You know, I I love. Uh, the arts and the culture. There's a vibrant business community here. Um, and uh, a lot of Fortune 500 companies are located in the Minneapolis metropolitan area. Um, and so all of that, what an urban culture sort of offers, but then uh, the rural culture that was for so many years based on small family farms and people who really depended on God for their provision um, and just a deep Faith that was part of so many people who lived in more rural parts of the state. Um, and now, of course, there's far fewer family farms and farmers are much more business oriented now. They have to be really savvy, but um, I love farmers. I love when we lived in the north, uh, in the western part of the state. Some farmers are some of my favorite people. And and then also, you know, health care is really big here in Minnesota. And I live in Rochester in southeast Minnesota, which is home of the Mayo Clinic. And Newsweek just said, I think for the, I don't know if it was the fourth or the 10th year in a row that Mayo is literally the world's best hospital. And so um, so we're a small city with um, just, yeah, probably the best healthcare in the whole world. So so this is a really fascinating part of the state with top tier doctors and scientists and, and um, medical technicians and all of that goes with that. And Mayo is just a investing $5 billion in our community in the coming years to make us really kind of hopefully the destination of choice for people from around the world. So, so that's pretty exciting to be a part of a community like that as well. And, uh, 
Um, so there's just a lot to appreciate. And so a lot to be grateful for living here in Minnesota. Well, for years, people didn't move to the South, but then they invented air conditioning. So they started moving South and uh, there's still heat available. So if you move to Minnesota, you could turn your heat up. <laughs> you know, I've lived in other parts of the country where maybe the outside temperature isn't as cold as it is in Minnesota, but the houses are built really well. And if you're inside, you know, by a crackling fire, it, it, there's no suffering here you yeah. know, for most people. So <laughs> yeah, it's a good place. All right. Well, we do appreciate you joining us today. And be before we go, uh, two things I want to do. I want I want you to pray for us. I appreciate your prayers for for me and your your heart and concern for um, uh, the what the NAE the work of the NAE advocating for those who can't advocate for themselves. And and I also want you just to kind of after you pray to finish up with uh, maybe a statement of how this is an election year. So how people can get involved, how they can contact the NAE or contact you and and uh, contact their congressman, what whatever they want, you know, however they want to get involved in the, the whole political scene. So first yeah. pray and then uh, then maybe bring it to a close with a little word on NAE. Sounds great. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you that you have created uh, people all across the world and you've rooted them in places some maybe aren't as fortunate to live in their homeland that they are fleeing because of all sorts of challenges, warfare, um, many reasons. But we thank you for the gift of place. We thank you for the gift of creation. We thank you for the gift of people, neighbors that you have put us in proximity with. And so, Lord, wherever you have placed uh, our listeners today, would you help them to bloom and thrive where they're planted, help them to represent you well. Uh, to the neighbors that you have given them. And uh, Lord, help us to continue to be students, to be creation students of the culture in which we are placed, um, people who are curious and, and grateful. And Lord, may that grow as we seek to represent you well and bring your good news uh, to the nations and also right to the neighborhoods in which we live. So we thank you for all of that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And uh, you invited me to just give a little commercial or a deck step. What I say often, and you've heard me say this, Scott, is that um, so many people are sort of wary of politics, and I get that. Uh, but we say often that politics involves policies, and those policies impact real people, and those are people that God loves. So just as we're called to love our neighbor and neighbors in very compassionate you know, acts of kindness, um, acts of love, uh, sometimes there are structures or systems that are set up there that are not entirely fair and so that's where our voice matters where we can speak for and with those who may be struggling and so we encourage people to reach out one of the best ways is to find resources on our website nae.org forward slash resources and there's many different topics you can click on the button and then for people if they can we really encourage them to at least write one letter to their member of congress and if you go to nae.org forward slash take hyphen action. So take hyphen action uh, at nae.org. And then we have sample letters that people can write and they can fully edit to say what they want to say. But we're trying to make it easier for people to speak up. And so that's a good starting place for people right. to, to start with. Yep. Okay, thank you very much. And thanks again for, for being on uh, Casual Conversations. And thanks for the work that you and your uh, fellow workers at NAE are doing. Thanks, Scott. Always a joy to be with you. And thank you to our listeners for tuning in to today's Casual Conversations. Join us again next time, and God bless you.